Hey it's Efrus and today I have a guide regarding what kind of PC you should build if you play games with active competitive scenes. Keep in mind this is going to be a single computer build as for most competitive games it is recommended you play the game on minimum settings. You do not want special effects and other unnecessary things blocking what could be very important information. So regardless of whether you play Counter-Strike, League of Legends, Overwatch, Starcraft, etc, this PC should be able to play each of those games to a desirable degree. I will put in very small incremental upgrades depending on what you want to do with said esports title, such as if you want to stream, record gameplay or make videos, or hit certain FPS marks. Also note that I'm going to try and make a build that is as friendly to PC gaming novices as possible, so this PC will be constructed of parts from very popular and reliable brands to ensure no research needs to be done to trust the hardware you are buying. It will be very easy to build once you acquire all the parts, and it should also look nice if you put some effort into cable management. I'm also going to be picking parts that are the most cost effective relative to MSRP, so brick and mortar prices, brick and mortar are online sales, and mail-in rebates will not be considered. The reason why I'm doing this is because I get bothered seeing people have computers that are a couple thousand dollars and they play these games, which is a huge overkill. Or they have a computer that costs one to two thousand dollars and they only play on 1080p 60fps. Don't get me wrong, gaming computer system manufacturers have become much more cost effective than they used to be, but customization is limited and you can still build your own PC and save yourself a hundred bucks or even more. I'm going to start with the motherboard because not only is everything going to connect to it, but you're not going to have to change your motherboard depending on the other parts you buy in this list for any reason. I recommend the ASUS H110MK. Not only do I love ASUS as a brand, as their dead on arrival rate and longevity are some of the best around, but this is one of the cheapest Micro ATX Socket LGA 1151 motherboards. It has 6 USB ports, 2 of which are USB 3, and it comes with dedicated PS2 mouse and keyboard ports. Now, most cheap motherboards only come with one 4-pin fan connector outside the CPU fan connector, and I highly recommend having more than one fan in your case. So I highly recommend finding a way to daisy chain your fans, which I'll have a suggestion later on in the video. For the power supply, I went with the Corsair CX450M. Corsair has recently refined their CX series of power supplies to not only look way better, but cost less. The CX450M is my go-to recommendation because you can find it for as low as 50 bucks and it comes with all black cables, something I have a very hard time finding in power supplies at this price point up until now. The internals aren't groundbreaking in any way, but they won't run the small risk of electrocuting you like a lot of cheap, poorly built power supplies. I find the Arctic F12 PWM PST fans to be extremely good in situations like this. You can get a 5-pack at Amazon for around $20, which is cheaper than buying 3 individual fans that I would personally consider worth buying for the noise, airflow, and price. The small deals are that they are PWM, so they will not always run at full speed depending on the workload your computer is experiencing, which means lower noise levels at idle, and they use fluid dynamic bearings, which typically last longer than most other bearings. The big deal is not only can they directly connect to the 4-pin fan header on the motherboard, but they can also be daisy-chained as they come with a 4-pin fan input that branches out of the 4-pin cable that they call PWM Sharing Technology, or PST, allowing you to connect, I believe, up to 3 fans in a daisy chain this way. On their website, they show the CPU cooler connected to one fan, which is connected to another fan, which is connected to the 4-pin CPU fan header. This means that for the case we're going to be using, we can connect the CPU's cooler's fan and two other fans to the 4-pin CPU fan header and the other three fans to the chassis fan header. You'd be fine only having one front fan, one CPU cooler fan, and one rear fan, but I personally greatly prefer airflow and lower temperatures over noise to a degree. Obviously, I'm not going to use several Delta fans or something like that. But considering that you can get a 5-pack for the same price as two of these fans individually, it just makes sense to get the 5-pack. For the case, I chose either the Corsair 88R or the Corsair Spec M2. They are both micro ATX cases, so this build should fit snugly in these cases. I think Corsair hit a bullseye making two cases that internally are objectively the same, but outside look different enough that you can pick either depending on what you prefer. You can also tell where the fans are going to go looking at this. PC Part Picker's YouTube channel actually built an entire PC in this case, so you have a very good guide as to how you should go about things like cable management and the order in which you should install parts. Let's start getting into the parts that are going to be going on the motherboard. For the CPU, I recommend the i3-6100 if you are just playing games, or the i5-6500 if you are streaming any of these games. 
If you are serious about editing or streaming, I would also recommend the Xeon E3 1230v3 for faster rendering times and higher resolutions and bit rates while streaming. But since this is not compatible with an LGA 1151 motherboard, you would have to go back to an LGA 1150 motherboard and you would have to get DDR3 RAM instead of DDR4 RAM since DDR4 isn't compatible with LGA 1150 motherboards. So I've listed equivalent hardware under that CPU. Also, you'll need to get a CPU cooler as only OEM slash tray models are left in stock, which doesn't come with a CPU cooler. None of the previous generation hardware should affect your overall performance in games. The reason why I suggest this CPU over an LGA 1151 Xeon CPU is because separate motherboards are being made for the LGA 1151 Xeons that are a hundred plus dollars more expensive, and they're just not worth it in any sense right now for gaming or streaming. You do not get enough of a performance gain for the price. Also, please do not get an i7. It is not only not cost-effective relative to a Xeon, since you're never going to be using the integrated graphics of an i7 since you have a GPU, but it will never be fully utilized even if you're streaming one of these games. Leave i7s to well-rounded, high-end builds for MMOs, editing and streaming, or CPU-intensive games. Also, it's fine to get an i5-6500 if you do play other, more demanding games casually. You could stick with the stock CPU cooler for the i3 and i5, however I recommend getting a third party CPU cooler for lower temperatures and significantly lower noise. If you are currently using a pre-built computer from Walmart or something, chances are the noise you hear when your computer really cranks up is from the CPU cooler. Since we are not overclocking and we're just looking for lower noise and temperatures, I decided to go for a Cryorig M9i. At $20, this fits the bill. The noise is much lower than a stock cooler under load, and it's small enough that you won't have to worry about installation or compatibility. Also, since both cases have side panel windows on them, I don't like the idea of getting a taller CPU cooler like the Cryobrig H7, where there's only a 5mm space between the end of the CPU cooler and the window. And that's if you don't raise the fan taller for RAM, or the Hyper 212 Evo, which just doesn't fit in the case at all, as it's spec to have support for CPU coolers up to 150mm. You could pretty much get any RAM, but for the sake of picking a reliable brand that looks nice in the PC, I went with Kingston HyperX Fury RAM. I suggest getting one 8 gig stick so you can upgrade to 16 gigs in the future if you need to. Also, if you already have a computer with 6 to 8 gigabytes of RAM and you constantly are pushing 80 to 90% RAM usage, I would suggest getting 16 gigabytes because full RAM load can dramatically affect multitasking performance even in basic things like browsing the internet. Normally, I would tell people who are just playing games to get a 120 slash 128 gig SSD, but not only are many games getting larger in size, 120 gig SSDs are starting to not be cost effective relative to 240, 250, 256 gig SSDs or 480, 500, 512 gigabyte SSDs. If you play several competitive titles and a few other games on your PC, a 120 gig SSD won't be enough. For example, World of Warcraft alone would eat up over half of this SSD storage after formatting if you've explored much of the game. Because of this, I recommend getting a 240 gig OCZ Tryon 150, a very cheap but still fast enough SSD. That means for the price, it's a great buy. 240 gigabytes should be more than enough even if you play League, StarCraft, Overwatch, and some MMOs. If you video edit, stream, or store a lot of media on your computer, you could also get the 480 gig version. Alternatively, you can get a one terabyte hard drive to store your music and videos on, as SSD speeds won't be taken advantage of for those kinds of media. The GPU is pretty cut and dry get an RX 460. Between all of them and their respective prices, I suggest the Sapphire 2 gig model. At $110, you'll be hard pressed to find a GPU that competes. It has dual fans, so it will be cooler under load, and will fill your case more for a better aesthetic. Also, it's just the second cheapest RX 460 behind the single fan power color model, which is only a few dollars less. However, this isn't why the RX 460 is cut and dry. The reason why is because of FreeSync. FreeSync can be present at the lower end of monitors while G-Sync is not. Even at 144Hz, FreeSync monitors cost much less, and this GPU will drive any of these games at 144fps at minimum settings for the most part. With the only exception really being Overwatch, which even then you'll rarely see your frame rates dip under 100 in firefights. If you never wish to see your FPS under 144Hz, then I would also recommend getting a Sapphire Nitro RX 480 4GB model, as it is the cheapest RX 480 right now at $230, making 8GB models too expensive, and RX 470 is not cost effective relative to this card. For monitors, it's a matter of what you want and how much money you have. If you are trying to make the cheapest build and have pretty much gone with the lowest cost parts up until this point, I would recommend getting the AOC G2260 VWQ6. 
It is a 21.5 inch 75 Hertz 1080p FreeSync display that, trust me, looks much smoother with FreeSync than regular VSync looks, even at 144 Hertz arguably. 75 Hertz 1080p FreeSync is very worth it in my opinion at $120. If you are looking for something more tournament standard or just wish to see higher refresh rates with FreeSync, then get an AOC G2460PF. This is a 24 inch 1080p FreeSync display with height adjust, pivot, swivel, and tilt. If you are streaming, you are going to need two displays. I would just suggest getting both of these monitors, but you can also keep the one you currently have and use it as a secondary display and get whichever one you want and can afford. There are also Nixius 144Hz FreeSync displays that go on sale every so often. I mostly see them on Newegg and Massdrop, but for the sake of this video, I'm going with parts that are always a constant price. Please don't get a monitor without FreeSync. GPU-based adaptive sync displays are so good and so cheap, it's just not worth it saving the additional dollars to get a cheaper 60Hz display. Peripherals are a matter of preference and fit to your hand anatomy, so I'm not going to recommend you any specific mice, keyboards, or headsets in this video. But I'm going to tell you that if you get a mouse and you really care about accuracy relative to your hand movements, get a mouse with an Avago 3366, 3360, 3310, 3988, or 3989 sensor. Thanks for watching this guide. I hope you learned enough from it to buy your parts and build your own computer. If you have any problems with the hardware I've listed, please comment below. Like or dislike the video depending on how you felt about it, subscribe and follow my various social media accounts if you want to see me make more videos, and share if you want all of what I just said to happen even more. Again, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.